Ahora sí vamos a comenzar, le doy la palabra al doctor Osvaldo Mesina para que haga la apertura formal de esta sesión. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias Victoria, gracias a todos, buenas noches, buenos días, depende de donde estén. Eh, queremos agradecerles a todos el estar conectados con esta reunión. Eh, quiero expresar mi satisfacción y, y alegría por compartir esta reunión, la coordinación con mi amigo Jorge Morales, de, un amigo de muchos años de amistad, y con el profesor Peter Evelyn, a quien tengo el gusto de conocer hace también mucho tiempo, que nos ha visitado aquí alguna vez en Buenos Aires y cuyas enseñanzas han sido muy, muy importantes. Es una autoridad reconocida mundialmente en el campo de la eh, enfermedad metabólica ósea y particularmente en la osteoporosis de los bar del varón. Eh, es un tema sumamente importante. Creemos que tenemos que prestar mucha atención a estos datos porque, como les va a mostrar Jorge, eh, eh, nosotros tenemos menos alerta hacia lo, lo que es la osteoporosis en hombres. No tenemos tanta información como en mujeres y, sin embargo, es un tema muy importante saber que los hombres pueden tener osteoporosis, se pueden fracturar y es bastante compleja el desarrollo y la patogenia de la osteoporosis en el varón. Sin querer eh, robar más tiempo, le paso la palabra a Jorge Morales que nos va a mostrar unos datos muy breves de, eh, de densitometría en varón. Gracias. En realidad, muchas gracias. También quiero agradecer a todos su presencia. Voy a mostrarles esta información una vez que el doctor Evelyn termine. Si me permiten, por favor. De damos paso a la presentación del doctor Evelyn. Thank you very much, Daniel and George, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I'm just so sorry I can't be with you there in person in Latin America. I think you know I've visited there about three times for holidays or professional meetings. And it's a place I always enjoy so much. The warmth and hospitality I receive is second to none. So um, greetings to you from Australia. And let's look forward to meeting again in the future. And I hope you're all keeping very well. So what I'd like to talk about today is osteoporosis in men, and these are my disclosures. I think it's a neglected condition, and we really have to think about it more carefully when patients are sitting in front of us in our consulting rooms. I'm going to briefly discuss mechanisms of bone loss in men and also cancer-related bone loss. I'll be relying heavily on the Endocrine Society guidelines on osteoporosis in men, And I'll also be discussing how you can assist, assess risk factors for osteoporosis in men. I'll there, then go through the evidence for osteoporosis treatments uh, and how long to treat and the gaps in the current evidence. So I think um, osteoporosis in men is important and one in six men will get a hip fracture by the age of 90 years and 50% of them before the age of 80. So we want people to age well, and we don't want them to be institutionalized or to die after a hip fracture uh, when they've earned their retirement. So I think we need to think about how we can prevent these. And we can see that the increase in hip fractures and vertebral fractures occurs after the age of 65 or so in men. And the lifetime risk of a minimal trauma fracture for men aged greater than 60 is about 30%. So it's highly significant. The mechanisms of bone loss in men really uh, differ from those in women. In women, we see trabecular loss uh, with estrogen deficiency after the menopause. But here in men, the situation is different. And these are data from high resolution CT scans from the Mayo Clinic um, showing the decline in trabecular uh, thick thickness with aging. And you can see that they're quite thick in a 23 year old male but then they thin progressively with age. And this thinning of trabecular is not related to uh, bone resorption. It's secondary to reduced bone formation. Whereas the trabecular loss seen in women is due to increased bone resorption. So what we find is that bone loss in both sexes accelerates after the age of 70. And in men, it's more common in those with the low testosterone level, or if we measure the bioavailable estradiol levels in men, 
we know those are also important and those are also low. So it's this reduction in bone formation that starts at a relatively young age that's important. And this is associated with decreases in IGF-1, which is growth hormone and also nutrition mediated. And serum IGF-1 is associated inversely with fracture risk uh, for all fractures and also for hip fractures. So a low IGF-1 uh, gives you an increased risk by about 1.5 of having a fracture. And the population attributable risk for fractures is about 7.5% for all fractures and about 23% uh, of hip fractures are due to IGF-1 changes. Now, cortical bone loss occurs after the age of 50 in men, and it is associated with uh, decreases in bioavailable testosterone and estradiol and increased bone remodeling. So this is when increased bone resorption becomes important later in life in men, whereas a reduction in bone formation occurs earlier in life. So both things are, are bad for the bones. And we know that cortical porosity is also important. And uh, these uh, slides of a bone biopsy shows that patients with a vertical, a vertebral fracture have increased cortical porosity, as you can see in the upper part of this section. And this is shown diagrammatically in a number of patients, that the patients with vertebral fractures have a higher risk of having increased cortical uh, porosity, and they also have reduced bone volume as a result. Now, what about bone turnover markers? How useful can they be clinically in sort of detecting patients, uh, men at risk of osteoporosis? So no, we know that uh, with bone modeling around the age of 20, uh, when there's still uh, bone mass accrual, uh, the last parts of that, that bone turnover markers are high in young men. Then they tend to decrease until the age of 50. Uh, and then they remain stable until about the age of 70. And we know that increases in bone turnover markers after the age of 70 are associated with reduced cortical thickness and volumetric bone density and also reduced trabecular thickness and a trabecular number. So we know that uh, they result in, in uh, increases in bone remodeling and bone resorption, which is bad for the microarchitecture of bone. And when we looked at uh, high bone turnover markers, they do predict increased fracture risk in elderly men. And this is uh, from Christian Meyer's work and uh, the relative risk of these two bone resorption markers in the highest quartile, there's particularly an increased risk of um, uh, fractures. So I think if patients have, say, a CTX in the highest quartile, uh, that could be a significant risk factor for them getting um, a fracture in the future. And obviously these uh, elderly men would be re responsive to anti-resorptive therapy. Now, I'm going to talk about um, uh, screening and also treating osteoporosis. And I'm going to use the Endocrine Society guidelines from 2012. This uses the grade system, which is the strength of recommendations and evidence quality. Uh, strong recommendations are we recommend um, and weak recommendations are we suggest. Um, and uh, there are only uh, 10 with strong recommendations and 13 with weak recommendations. And if they grade the quality of evidence, uh, there are actually uh, no recommendations where the, the quality of evidence was high. There were six recommendations that had moderate quality and 14 with low quality evidence. So these will be indicated with, when I'm talking about what we should do. And this has been diagrammatic, uh, diagrammatically shown by Piet Guzens uh, in reviews of rheumatology. Um, so what we think in patients with vertebral and hip fracture, they should really be assessed for secondary causes of osteoporosis and falls risk. And then they should go on to a treatment strategy and be monitored with bone density every one or two years. Now, if patients uh, have uh, a non-vertebral, non-hip fracture, if they have low bone density, they should also be treated. And those patients greater than 70 with a T-score uh, in the osteopenic range, uh, should go on and have screening for vertebral fractures. And if they have any evidence of a vertebral fracture or a high 
frac score greater than 20% for major fractures or greater than 3% for hip fractures, they should also go on to be investigated for secondary causes of osteoporosis and treated. And uh, of course, in patients on long-term glucocorticoids, will be uh, the treatment threshold will be at a lower T-score. So if people are going to be on seven milligrams of uh, prednisolone or for three months or longer, they only need a T-score of minus 1.5 to consider treatment. So I think this is a good way of thinking about it in just um, the presence or absence of fractures. So getting back for screening with bone density testing, they suggest men at increased risk of osteoporosis should have a DEXA measurement. And that would be all men over the age of 70 and age 50 to 69 with risk factors. So that could be a history of fracture after the age of 50, diseases or conditions associated with osteoporosis, uh, drugs such as glucocorticoids or GnRH agonists for prostate cancer, alcohol abuse, smoking, and other causes of secondary osteoporosis, such as HIV. The FRAX, Garvin, or other fracture risk calculators uh, can be used to uh, uh, improve the assessment of absolute fracture risk. So there was uh, um, moderate quality evidence. Now, in men with uh, low bone mass or osteoporosis, they do recommend vertebral fracture assessment. And we can do this quite easily with a one minute scan uh, using DEXA on a lateral DEXA scan. So you just have to request that. And most bone density units in Australia can do that, but I'm not sure what the case is in Latin America. But if it isn't available or um, you're not sure, you can certainly get a lateral spinal X-ray instead. Now, I don't have to tell you, we make the diagnosis of osteoporosis based on these uh, WHO criteria. So osteoporosis is indicated if the T-score is less than or equal to minus 2.5. And we'd say patients have a severe osteoporosis if the T-score is less than or equal to minus 2.5 and they have a fracture. So obviously it's a gradation of risk and uh, it's a bit artificial to have these cutoffs. So I think uh, the other thing we need to think about is the value of the Z score. And here we've got a patient uh, at the age of uh, ab about uh, 70 and their Z score is minus 2.1. So I think they're well outside the normal range for their age and sex. And so uh, when we have a Z score in this range, I think we'd probably investigate these patients more carefully for a secondary cause of osteoporosis. And uh, that's because they're outside the population range. And this is FRAX that you're familiar with. And uh, this in includes a number of uh, risk factors that we put in as well as the patient's age. So here I've included a, a 70 year old male with no clinical risk factors for osteoporosis and a T-score of minus 2.5. His major osteoporotic uh, fracture risk would be 11%, so that's below the therapeutic threshold of 20%. Uh, but his hip fracture risk is 4.3%, which is above the threshold of 3%. So we would treat this individual. Now, what happens if we put the same individual in the Garvin calculator but instead we add one fall over the last 12 months. But you'll note that he hasn't had a fracture like he didn't in the previous one. His age is the same and the T-score is the same. So what we find is the hip fracture risk is slightly higher at 5.9%. It's still in the treatment range. Uh, and his any osteoporotic fragility fractures risk is higher than with FRAX at about 16%. But again, it's probably below the therapeutic range. But the outcome is the same. We elect to treat this patient because his hip fracture risk over 10 years is above the therapeutic threshold. So these are the well-known risk factors uh, for um, osteoporosis in men. And what we need to really uh, uh, think about is smoking and a high alcohol intake because these are the two predominant risk factors we see, as well as older age. Uh, a previous fracture, physical or functional limitations and a risk of falling and low body weight. Um, 
The protective factors are regular weight bearing physical activity, and that's been identified as at least three hours a week, adequate dietary calcium, and having a serum uh, 25D level above 50 nanomoles per litre. So common secondary causes are Cushing's syndrome or exogenous corticosteroids um, and primary or secondary hypogonadism um, and a family history, uh, but we don't have any genes that we can measure to quantify this any further. And, and there are many other causes. And so sometimes we see um, people who train excessively uh, physically, they can have a low body mass index and high exercise levels, and that can shut off their gonadotrophins. So that can make them at risk of osteoporosis. Um, and we have anti-epileptic drugs, thyrotoxicosis, primary hypoparathyroidism, diabetes, chronic liver or kidney disease, celiac disease, high urinary calcium, HIV and its treatment with some antiretroviral drugs, rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylosis, inflammatory bowel disease, mastocytosis, and androgen deprivation therapy, uh, warfarin and heparin, uh, and genetic causes such as X-linked osteoporosis and osteogenesis imperfecta. So with lifestyle modification, uh, most uh, men at risk of osteoporosis should get about 1,000 or 1,200 uh, milligrams of calcium a day. Ideally, we'd recommend this is from dietary sources and we'd only use a calcium supplement uh, if dietary calcium is insufficient. And uh, the US guideline suggested um, levels of uh, 25D of at least 30 nanograms per mil or 75 nanomoles per litre. And this uh, is uh, often requiring supplementation. And weight bearing exercise for 30 to 40 minutes per session, three or four sessions per week, but a low level of evidence and uh, reduction in alcohol uh, intake and cessation of smoking were recommended. So I'm just going to show you the osteoporosis guidelines we have in Australia. Again, we've developed this with family doctors and this is for postmenopausal women and men aged greater than 50 years. And again, the algorithm is very similar. In those with a minimal trauma or hip or vertebral fracture, they should go on to treatment. With a minimal trauma fracture at any other site, we'd recommend bone densitometry and treating those uh, with um, a low bone density. And in patients aged 70 years or more, again, we'd recommend bone density testing and uh, absolute fracture risk assessment as we would with patients with other secondary causes of osteoporosis listed here. So um, we found this has been a very useful way for family doctors just to have this one page document they can refer to and demystify the treatment pathway for osteoporosis. So I'm going to now move to the evidence for um, osteoporosis treatments in men. So this is quite interesting because uh, men are hard to get in clinical trials and as we know from the studies in postmenopausal women, we really need thousands of women in a trial to get um, strong fracture endpoints. So in the studies in men, uh, they're more looking at bone density or surrogate outcomes, and they're used as bridging studies. There is a lack of data from published trials using fractures as a primary endpoint with the exception of zoledronic acid. Uh, and this is for spinal fractures. There are also data for secondary endpoints with alendronate, residronate, teriparatide, and denosumab. And we know that all of these medications and romosusumab increase spine and hip bone density, but we wouldn't recommend combination therapy with PTH and bisphosphonates. So the guidelines recommend that pharmacological therapy is recommended for men at high risk of fracture, and again, it's men who've had a vertebral or hip fracture uh, and men without fractures whose T-score is less than minus 2.5 and men who have osteopenia and a 10-year risk of experiencing any fracture of greater than 20% uh, or hip fracture greater than 3% based on their clinical risk factors. 
and uh, they recommended treatment with uh, the medications uh, that you're all familiar with. Uh, and these were alendronate, residronate, zoledronic acid, and teriperitide. Uh, and with denosumab, uh, that could also be used for men on androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. And the selection of the treatment should be individualized. Um, and because of data from uh, the Lyle study, uh, in men with a recent hip fracture, they suggested treatment with zoledronic acid um, and teriperitide should not be given with concomitant anti-resorptive therapy. Uh, but there are data uh, that this may uh, be beneficial, particularly with denosumab. So these are the uh, uh, data for alendronate and it shows uh, increases in spinal bone density that are quite um, strong at about 7% over two years compared with placebo. And these were highly significant. Um, there also was a reduction in uh, quantitative vertebral fractures measured by the Genot uh, method. And uh, that was 7.1% uh, in the placebo group and less than 1% in the treatment group, and that was significant. So this was a secondary endpoint that was significant. So there was a one-year open-label study uh, done uh, in Germany that showed increases in spine and hip bone density with residronate and a reduced risk of vertebral fractures, but this study was not blinded. Um, there was also a Japanese study that showed a reduced hip fracture rate in patients treated with residronate after um, a stroke. And uh, there was a large study uh, by Boonen that showed increases in spine and hip bone density, but didn't have any fracture data. And if one looks at the comparison of intravenous zoledronic acid, five milligrams versus a weekly 70 milligrams of oral alendronate in men with osteoporosis, and looks at the increases in bone density at up to two years, there are no differences. So really, if you were treating with either um, oral or lentinate, 70 milligrams a week and the patients were taking it or giving them uh, annual intravenous uh, zoledronic acid infusions, uh, the, the increases in bone density would be similar. Now, when zoledronic acid was compared with placebo in this um, large study, uh, there was a significant uh, 67% reduction in vertebral fractures compared with placebo. So uh, the number of uh, men you would need to treat would be 30 to get a reduction in one vertebral fracture in this study. And that was seen as early as 12 months with a 68% reduction, but a lower absolute risk reduction at 12 months. So it would be good to treat with uh, zoledronic acid for at least two years to get the benefit on vertebral fractures from this study. And I think this was the study I referred to earlier from Ken Lyles, looking at treatment with zoledronic acid after a hip fracture. And this reduced uh, clinical fracture risk, and it also reduced the risk of mortality. So the risk of mortality was starting to decrease about uh, 16 months after the hip fracture, after one or two infusions of zoledronic acid. And overall, there was a 28% reduction in mortality, which was due to a reduced uh, number of cardiovascular events and infections. With denosumab, that's also been compared with uh, placebo. And the results on bone density are very similar with the other anti-resorptive drugs. And over 12 months, there was a 5.7% improvement in spinal bone density compared to 0.9% in placebo. At the total hit, 2.4% increase compared with 0.3%. And uh, similar changes at the other femoral neck and trochanter sites. And at the radius, there was also an increase in bone density. So denosumab's also been used to prevent bone loss and fractures associated with androgen deprivation therapy in patients with prostate cancer. And this was a very large study with 734 uh, patients assigned to receive placebo or denosumab uh, with uh, 445 to 467 completing this 36 month study. So over the study course of three years, there was 63% um, uh, completion rates 
uh, in these patients with cancer. And these were the increases in bone density with denosumab. So there were increases of bone density of about 6% over three years of the lumbar spine, 4% uh, of the total hip, um, slightly lower at the femoral neck and uh, significant differences at the radius as well, a side of cortical bone. And what was interesting to me was this reduction in vertebral fractures that was evident as early as 12 months and uh, uh, continued out to 36 months. Um, and the um, relative risk uh, was much lower and it was down to 85% lower um, in the first uh, 12 months. And, uh, and this was independent of bone density. So most of these patients had osteopenia rather than, um, than having osteoporosis. And um, another CIRM, toromemaphine, was also effective at reducing vertebral fractures, but unfortunately that was uh, associated with an increased risk of DVT. So that's not used in treating this group of patients. Soledronic acid has also been studied in uh, 1,071 men with prostate cancer. And uh, they, um, had treatment with androgen suppression therapy and radiotherapy um, and uh, they had 18 months of zoledronic acid in one arm of the study and uh, there were uh, 132 incident vertebral fractures and 72 non-spinal fractures over three years um, but the androgen suppression therapy for six and 18 months caused significant reductions in hip bone density at two and four years which was completely pre prevented by zoledronic acid. But the study was not powered to look at differences in fracture rates. So zoledronic acid can also reduce bone loss uh, in men on androgen deprivation therapy. What about teriparatide? Um, until recently, this has been the only um, anabolic agent we've had in Australia. And I was involved in this study many, many years ago and this looked at the incidence of vertebral fractures in men during 11 months of treatment because the study was uh, uh, stopped prematurely and then 18 months of follow-up. And what was shown uh, in the two doses of uh, PTH used, and we know that we use the 20 microgram dose in clinical practice, uh, that the um, reduction was 52%. And the relative risk of moderate or severe vertebral fractures was even lower, and that was reduced by 83%. So we know uh, from studies in postmenopausal women that teriparatide is better than residronate in preventing vertebral fractures in particular. Um, there's been one study with um, romozuzumab in men with osteoporosis. And again, this uh, uh, is a, a study that was for 12 months um, and patients were randomized two to one romosuzumab two placebo. The dose of romosuzumab was uh, given as 210 milligrams every month. They had a loaning dose of 50 or 60,000 units of vitamin D, whichever was available at the institution. And the other group had placebo. So the double blind period was only for 12 months. And what can be seen here is that there were significant increases in lumbar spine bone density of 12.1% over 12 months, compared to 1.2% in the placebo group. And at the total hip, it was 2.5% um, compared with a small loss of negative 0.5%. And again, a significant increase at the femoral neck of 2.2%. So in terms of bone density, there were significant increases in bone density, particularly at the spine over the 12 month treatment course with romosuzumab. If uh, one looks at the baseline characteristics to try and see if any group benefited more from romosuzumab over the 12 months, there were certainly no differences for the, the baseline osteoporotic fracture risk, uh, the age group, or the minimum baseline BMD T-score but it seemed to be uh, more effective uh, in uh, those patients who had a normal testosterone level at baseline. So that was the only difference. And overall, if you combine everything, uh, uh, it was, uh, as we saw, about 11% improvement. Um, 
Now, when adverse events were looked at in this relatively small study, and there were 163 patients on romosuzumab and 81 on placebo, there, there was an imbalance in severe adverse events with 21 in the romosuzumab group and 10 in the placebo group, uh, but the, uh, the, the percentage changes were very similar. But where we're seeing the difference really is in adjudicated cardiovascular serious adverse events, but the numbers are incredibly small and it's difficult to uh, take anything away from this study, but there was a 4.9% in the romosuzumab group and 2.5% in the placebo group. Um, there were no differences in deaths or other um, adverse events with the, uh, the exception of cardiac ischemic events only being in the romosuzumab group. So getting back to the guidelines for men at high risk of fracture receiving testosterone therapy, uh, there is a recommendation to add an agent with proven anti-fracture efficacy. So that could be, nowadays it would be bisphosphonate, uh, denosumab, teriparatide or romosuzumab. Um, and they suggest teeth therapy alone for men at borderline risk for fracture who had low testosterone levels. And uh, testosterone therapy for men at high risk of fracture with um, levels of low levels of testosterone who lack indications for teeth therapy, but have um, contraindications to approve pharmacological agents. So um, I think the most important thing to note is they recommend even in patients who um, are on testosterone therapy, uh, that if they're at high fracture risk, they should also be on uh, an anti-osteoporotic drug. And uh, we know the effect of testosterone on spinal bone density is related to the pre-treatment testosterone concentration. So those with the most severe androgen deficiency will have the greatest gain in bone density when they start treatment. So I think one thing we're considering now, and we're updating our Australian guidelines on osteoporosis management at the moment, with them being upgraded next year. Uh, but we have to think about categorizing patients into this very high risk category. And the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists has really been one of the first groups to try and uh, define this difference. And what they've done is uh, said that anybody with a recent fracture uh, within 12 months is in very high risk group. And that's related to the risk of a subsequent fracture being very high in the first 12 months after initial fracture. They've also said two or more fractures while on anti-osteoporotic therapy, uh, use of drugs that cause skeletal harm. So that could be glucocorticoids or androgen deprivation therapy bone density T-scores less than minus three, or a FRAX score of greater than 4.5% over 10 years at the hip, or greater than 30% over 10 years for a major osteoporotic fracture, and, and those with a high fall risk. So obviously you don't have to have all of these, you just have to have one or two to make you concerned. And um, we are familiar with the high risk group, which would be a previous hip or spine fracture, uh, more than 12 months ago, a bone density T-score in the osteoporotic range and a FRAX of 3% or 20%. So I think this is a useful framework. And what we're trying to identify is this very high risk group that would benefit the most from anabolic therapy. And as you know, there are more anabolic treatments available now uh, with teriparatide, our uh, long-term uh, treatment but now abaloparatide and romosuzumab. So what about monitoring treatment? Uh, most of us would decide to monitor treatment because we want to know if our treatment is working. And this can be done every one or two years. We'd probably recommend two years in Australia. Now, um, in looking at this monitoring, if the bone density reaches a plateau, you could certainly cut down the frequency of uh, uh, bone density measurements. And what we'd think is an increase of 3% at the spine and 5% at the hip are significant changes based on the accuracy of uh, or precision of bone densitometry. Um, 
and longer intervals uh, between scans might be indicated in untreated men who you're following up. Uh, and I think it has been shown that if men get shown their bone density test, uh, there's better compliance with therapy. Um, and certainly I use a bone turnover marker three or, uh, months after initiation of an anti-resorptive uh, therapy, particularly the oral bisphosphonates. And I use the P1NP three months after starting an anabolic treatment. And uh, we, we can look at the concept of least significant change or just um, aim for a target below the median of the normal range in men for a bone turnover marker. But I guess we don't have that range for men yet. Uh, and if there is a lack of change in a bone turnover marker, it really means that we need to look for a, a non-compliance, a secondary cause for osteoporosis we've missed, or we need to change the treatment or the route of administration. So I, I'm a believer in using bone turnover markers in these two situations. So in summary, what, what, am, what do I think about managing osteoporosis in men after many years of experience? I think it's unfortunate that osteoporosis is viewed largely as a disease of women by patients and many doctors, and men are generally reluctant to see doctors and engage in preventative care. Cultural and language barriers to diagnose and continuing care are common in a diverse society, such as that you have in Latin America, and certainly that we have here in a, a big urban center like Melbourne. Structured screening for osteoporosis in men aged greater than 50 years can be implemented in general practice. So I think we have to develop strong partnerships with general practitioners. And in Australia, they're the main doctors that manage osteoporosis. Uh, with, with specialists like me seeing difficult cases. I think secondary causes of osteoporosis are more common in men than in postmenopausal women. So we have to screen for these more carefully. And we have to be aware of the common traditional risk factors I've mentioned and certainly address them, which is often hard to do. But males tend to prefer clear instructions, a clear rationale for treatment, injectable or parenteral therapy rather than long-term oral therapy and an objective assessment of outcomes such as a bone density test or a bone turnover marker. So I think what we're thinking about nowadays is managing osteoporosis across the lifespan. Uh, and what uh, we would think about is if we are initiating people on denosumab, uh, we have to really continue with this unless there's a good reason to stop because we're not sure about how we transition off therapy. So at the moment, we think we'd give a, an infusion of zoledronic acid, but we're not sure of the best timing of that infusion of zoledronic acid when patients might be transitioning off to nosumab. There's also some evidence for giving a weekly bisphosphonate for one or two years to maintain the benefit. But I think the problem is that sometimes bone is still lost, uh, even if we use a bisphosphonate, if people transition off to nosumab. With bisphosphonates, we're worried about the long-term associations of atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. Even though they're rare, they uh, can be associated with long-term use. So we're thinking about using bisphosphonates for five or seven years, then having a couple of years off therapy and if there's uh, bone loss or a further fracture, having another course of bisphosphonate therapy. And we use teriperitide and romosuzumab uh, for a first uh, initial treatment failure. And romosuzumab is the new drug that we use uh, that has just become available since the 1st of April in Australia for men as well as women. So I'd like to conclude, um, and I'm looking forward to the questions, that guidelines provide a useful management framework for fracture prevention in older men, and they've made the best synthesis of the limited evidence that we have. Osteoporosis in men is neglected and deserves more attention. So thank you for joining this seminar today. However, there is a lack of high quality evidence based on fracture reduction in men on which to base recommendations unlike in postmenopausal women. And we need further research in osteoporosis in men to increase the level of evidence to that in women.
So I'd like to thank you. And this is my uh, department in uh, Melbourne at Monash University uh, and my team, uh, which is quite diverse. And uh, I'd also like to thank the IOF uh, for supporting Meet the Expert IOF Latin America Bonecast. And uh, as you know, this will also be available as a recording after the webinar today. So thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Peter. Eh, entiendo que tenemos lugar para preguntas. Que algunas han llegado. Hay cuatro, creo, registradas. Uh, quisiera que dejaras de compartir tu pantalla, Peter, para compartir la mía. Mientras el doctor Jorge Morales prepara su pantalla, les recuerdo que ya está activada la sección para que empiecen a enviar sus preguntas. Quiero dar las gracias al doctor Evelyn por recordarnos la importancia de la atención de la osteoporosis en los hombres. Quise mostrarles esta diapositiva de una experiencia en el hospital donde yo trabajo donde de cerca de mil densitometrías solicitadas en el Hospital Aranda de la Parra en estos 10 meses, solamente 46 de 941 fueron en hombres, es decir, menos de 5% de las densitometrías que los médicos solicitan para estudiar a sus pacientes fueron hechas en hombres. Cuando, como ya escucharon en la presentación, que de las fracturas de cadera de cada tres fracturas, una es eh, en un hombre. De manera que eh, esta diapositiva es muy sencilla, muy simple. Nos hace pensar que los médicos estamos pensando menos de lo debido en la osteoporosis en los hombres. Y por esa razón tenemos algunas limitaciones en nuestra comprensión de esto. Y por eso los invito a todos nosotros. Eh, esto también lo debo hacer como un mea culpa. Aquí debe haber más pacientes míos, eh, más hombres, pacientes que atienden a verme a mí, que estuvieran siendo estudiados apropiadamente. Así que de manera que los invito a que pensemos más en esta eventualidad y de demos paso a las preguntas. ¿Quieres comenzar tú, Osvaldo, con la primera? Tu micrófono. La traducción la hacen automáticamente, ¿no? Sí. ¿Así es? Bueno, la... Uh, Camilo Quintero pregunta, tengo un paciente varón de 65 años con secuelas de poliomielitis, con parecia en miembro inferior derecho, cadera derecha tiene un T-score de menos 3.2, la izquierda es normal y la columna es normal. ¿Estaría indicado el tratamiento con un antiosteoporótico o se debe considerar como secuela normal? de neuromuscular de la poliomielitis. Gracias. Yeah, well, thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, we've been looking at uh, patients with uh, cerebral palsy and uh, spina bifida, and uh, despite the cause of the bone loss being due to neuromuscular causes, they do have an increased risk of fractures, particularly of, of the lower limb, including the hip and femur. So uh, with that, his age and that T-score of minus 3.2, I think I would recommend treatment. And uh, what I would recommend is treatment uh, probably with intravenous zoledronic acid um, in, in this individual. Uh, we, we've been using that in, in the patients with uh, cerebral palsy and spina bifida. So I think uh, we need a strong treatment that's going to work, and that might be a good one for this patient. La doctora Fabiana Subies pregunta es, eh, acerca de si en un paciente con cáncer de próstata estaría indicado el tratamiento con teriparatide por su acción anabólica. Yes. Yes, no, that's a really good question and a bit contentious. 
So as we know, um, the use of teriparatide is contraindicated in patients who've got any history of radiotherapy and uh, the prostate radiotherapy would also involve the pelvis. So that would exclude some men with prostate cancer. And the other concern would be if they had skeletal metastases that the teriparatide might influence the growth of skeletal metastases. Um, I can say that uh, we published a paper last year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where we did the first uh, trial of teriparatide just for two months uh, versus placebo in patients in, with ONJ, in, in cancer patients predominantly. Um, and they had a beneficial response with a reduction in the ONJ lesions with teriparatide. And there was no increased risk of cancer in those patients. But that was a trouble we had with the reviewers uh, in, in getting that paper published. <laughs> La siguiente pregunta está en inglés, pero es, luego de suspender denosumab, ¿con qué periodicidad hay que monitorear los marcadores de recambio óseo? Yeah, well, I wouldn't recommend uh, suspending denosumab, as I indicated before, and I can see Daniel and George are nodding there in agreement. Um, and I think if I've seen a patient where they've come in with... Uh, vertebral fractures after it was stopped by a dentist. Um, and when I measured the CTX, it was 1300. So it was very high. Uh, so uh, you can measure it, but it'll just shock you and uh, give you a fright. So I wouldn't recommend it. Instead, I would recommend either restarting the denosumab or giving uh, a bisphosphonate. Yeah. La doctora Natasha Belén Murillo pregunta, Solicita IGF-1 de rutina ante la sospecha de causas secundarias de osteoporosis en el hombre y en la mujer? Yeah, that, that's a really good question because I didn't... That is a very good... Okay. Um, yeah, well, that's a very good question because I did give you theoretical evidence that IGF-1 is important. I guess they were from research studies uh, and we wouldn't uh, think of measuring IGF-1 as a risk factor, but I think uh, IGF-1 is also um, affected by nutrition, so uh, as well as growth hormone. So if you did measure it and you found it was low, it could be growth hormone deficiency, but it's more likely to be due to poor nutrition And again, we know poor nutrition is associated with osteoporosis. So it could be a marker of in increasing protein intake uh, for that individual, if you like. But we don't routinely measure it. So that's a good question. Okay. Eh, en hombres con osteoporosis, de alto, con alto riesgo de fractura, ¿cuál considera la mejor opción de tratamiento? ¿Ácido soledrónico <laughs> o denosumab? Gracias. Yes. Uh, well, that's a good question. And I think, uh, again, we've got to individualize treatment uh, for the patient sitting in front of you. So, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, younger men with HIV and uh, anti-retroviral uh, drug associated osteoporosis. They also have a lot of traditional risk factors for osteoporosis. So would I treat them with denosumab? Probably not, because if they're 35 or 40, they would need to remain on denosumab for many years. Whereas I would prefer to use zoledronic acid. But then if I've got somebody who's 75 uh, or 70 and uh, are, they have osteoporosis, you could use either drug. So I think it really depends on the patient sitting in front of you. One is not better than the other in terms of reducing fractures. They're both very similar. So it just depends on the patient characteristics, I think, more than... Uh, the individual characteristics of the drugs. La doctora Marta Forero pregunta si la evidencia con romososumab es igual en hombres que en mujeres. Yes, so the only thing we can do is compare the bone density improvements um, at the different sites in men and women, and they're very similar. So I think the changes were at the spine after 12 months were about 
in women and they were over 12% in men. So very similar, I, I think we would say. El doctor Enrique Aguilar pregunta si se puede utilizar la combinación de teriparatide y de nosumab. Yes, yeah, so um, we have information from um, the data study and the data switch study that if we combine teriparatide with denosumab, um, we can get greater increases in bone density at the hip. But that was a relatively small study. Um, but the, the, probably the situation where I use it the most now is um, denosumab is frequently used in Australia because it's um, reimbursed as a first line treatment for osteoporosis. And then if patients have fractures on denosumab uh, and I want to transition them to teriparatide, we know that uh, if we do that and stop the denosumab, there'll be bone loss at the hip. So what I do is actually continue with the denosumab while, when I start the teriparatide. So that's probably the main situation when I use both together in a practical sense. Pregunta el doctor Luis Ángel Mendoza, ¿cuál es el paciente ideal para iniciar terapia secuencial? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're thinking about it very carefully now. Um, and I think it's that very high risk uh, patient that I mentioned from the, the slide from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. In a perfect world, if we had a perfect world, we don't. Uh, we could use an anabolic treatment initially uh, and then follow with anti-resorptive treatment. So to me, that is the ideal treatment for patients, particularly with quite low bone density. So a T-score of less than minus three or minus 3.5, they're the, the ones that will benefit um, in terms of reaching a target bone density very much more quickly uh, than uh, with anti-resorptive therapy. So the studies have been compared with the Freedom uh, and Freedom Extension study and then the FRAME study. So uh, when uh, that comparison was made, if you give one year of romosuzumab, it's equivalent to giving about three and a half years of denosumab. And then if you follow that one year of romosuzumab with one year of denosumab, that's two years, that's equivalent in changes of bone density of over seven years of denosumab therapy. So what it means if we use these anabolic drugs up front, we are, um, have the value of reaching a target faster, but there are also beneficial changes on the bone itself, the architecture. El doctor Carlos Francisco Ceballos hace una pregunta que comienza, me parece, con una afirmación. Dice, todos los pacientes harán osteoporosis y habría, todos los varones harán osteoporosis y habría forma de prevenirla. Yeah, I think prevention is really important. So again, it's a lifestyle modification stopping smoking, uh, reducing the alcohol intake, ensuring adequate calcium and vitamin D. But I, th I think here we've been involved in Australia in community-based exercise programs, and those have included men. So uh, they've been published in the JBMR, and it, it was called the Osteocyze Program with Rob Daly. And um, what we did then was to have community-based uh, weight-bearing exercise programs And that resulted in increases in bone density of a couple of percent. So I think the combination of these lifestyle factors, uh, uh, modifications, is really important in trying to prevent osteoporosis. It's a good point. La doctora Rosa Scuteri nos pregunta sobre su experiencia acerca del manejo de pacientes menores de 60 años que tienen osteopenia y que además tienen cirugía de columna donde ha habido eh, pérdida de hueso alrededor del material metálico, antiresortivos o anabólicos, además de testosterona, dice la pregunta. Sí, yeah, that's, that's a good uh, question. Um, I think uh, there is some evidence in antiresortivos might... Um, help with that periprosthetic bone loss. Um, I know um, there's a trial going on in New York at the uh, Special 
um, hospital there in, in New York where Joe Lane is and, and Emily Stein is doing it, where they're giving preoperative teriparatide to look at outcomes of um, spinal surgery, where there are, there are implants to see if they take better with teriparatide before the surgery. So um, the role of teriparatide seems to be uh, before the surgery uh, and then anti-resorptives maybe prevent bone loss after the surgery. So um, I think it's an ongoing area of research and we don't know an awful lot, but anti-resorptives might be helpful. La doctora Marta Forero pregunta si es mejor la respuesta en hombres que en mujeres con lesiones medulares. Y después dice, basándose en la masa ósea previa en hombres de igual tiempo de evolución de la lesión. Um, sorry, what are medullary lesions? I'm not clear about that. Spinal lesions. Spinal oh, okay. Lesions. Well, spinal yeah. fractures or... Um... No, neurological lesions. Neurological lesions. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure about the answer to that. Maybe George or uh, Daniel could help me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of evidence. Uh, no. But it's a good question. Probablemente buena pregunta y no tenemos una buena respuesta. Eso. Me informan yes, de la oficina. Right. Me informan de la oficina que podemos seguir unos minutos más. Hay algunas preguntas más que quisiera hacer. Eh, yes. Están. Eh, hay una pregunta de de La Paz, Baja California, en México, de la licenciada Sandra Georgina Fernández donde nos habla acerca de indicación a temprana edad en la etapa de la vida del ser humano que auxilie al desarrollo, que evite la pre, eh, o que permita prevenir el desarrollo de osteoporosis en hombres y mujeres. Estoy pensando en que esta pregunta va orientada a, desde niños. ¿Esta enfermedad de ancianos tendríamos que estarla previniendo desde niños? Yeah, well, that's a very perceptive question because um, I think um, what we can do is um, around the time of puberty and just before puberty is the optimal time for increasing the peak bone mass. And uh, there have been studies that show if you have weight-bearing exercise at that time, you can increase the peak bone mass by 10 or 15%. So exercise has an incredible impact on the growing skeleton at that time, whereas the calcium and vitamin D is more permissive to achieve that. So unfortunately, what we're seeing with kids now is um, when I was a kid, I used to go outside and run around after school, but now they go in and look at a screen. So um, we need to change this behavior in children. But I think you're quite right in indicating that even though osteoporosis is a disease of old age and we focus on bone loss. I think we need to focus on childhood in building up the bone bank to prevent it. So the genesis of osteoporosis is laid down in, in youth. Yo tengo una pregunta, voy a, voy a hacer una pregunta. Eh, eh, Peter, ¿hay algún estudio comparativo de romososumab versus periparatide en varones? No, so there's only the uh, structure study which looked at postmenopausal women. And um, these were patients who'd been on bisphosphonates for at least three years. Then they were transitioned to alendronate for one year. And then they were treated with either romosuzumab or teriparatide for 12 months. Um, in, in those studies, the increases in bone density with romosuzumab were about double those of teriparatide. But these were in women. Uh, but I think uh, the overall increase in bone density was somewhat blunted compared with uh, treatment naive individuals who were, uh, who were treated with romosuzumab. So the increase in bone density was about 9% at the spine compared with about 13.5% if patients were treatment naive. So um, yeah, there's evidence that in terms of bone density and uh, bone strength at the uh, hip, that uh, in women, uh, romosuzumab is superior to teriparatide, but there aren't the same studies in men. Mm 
Tenemos otra pregunta del doctor Bruno Muzzi eh, de Brasil. Dice, entonces deberíamos asumir que el ácido soledrónico y el, el risedronato están mejor apoyados para hombres eh, por la evidencia que el alendronato o el ibandronato? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think um, probably the best evidence is with zoledronic acid, as I said, the, they use vertebral fractures as a primary endpoint. But the data for um, the other medications are very similar uh, with the changes in bone density. So uh, it's much of a muchness. And I think the main thing is to treat the patient who's at high fracture risk and make sure they are on a treatment that they'll adhere to. So. I think that's the most important thing. <clears throat> ¿Algún otro comentario, Daniel? Eh, no, por mi parte no. Creo que, creo que está muy claro, digamos, eh, Peter desarrolló el tema con mucha, muy, muy abarcativamente, digamos. No, no tengo otra pregunta por ahora, no sé si hay más preguntas. Si Jorge, ¿tienes alguna pregunta más? Yo quiero agradecer a todos los, los asistentes. Tuvimos eh, un buen número de asistentes que nos acompañaron y que estuvieron generando muchas preguntas. Probablemente hay alguna que se nos haya pasado por ahí. Quiero agradecerte, Peter, por tu excelente presentación. Y doy paso aquí a la a licenciada Mónica Caló que nos, eh, para que nos dé los mensajes finales de esta sesión. Muchas gracias. gracias. Bueno, eh... Gracias, Thank Jorge. You, George and Daniel. Eh, gracias, eh, Jorge, Daniel, eh, profesora Evelyn, muchísimas este, gracias por haber aceptado nuestra invitación eh, a participar en este ciclo. La verdad que creo que es un lujo, fue un lujo la presentación, muy interesante el debate, gracias a Jorge y, al, y a Osvaldo. Y bueno, nada, eh, gracias por este espacio de preguntas, creo que fueron muy interesantes, es un tema que atrapa, tenemos mucho todavía para eh, concientizar y, y alertar acerca de la osteoporosis en el hombre, así que bueno, creo que esto ha sido una buena contribución para los profesionales de la región en este sentido. Muchísimas gracias eh, por compartir los conocimientos, este, bueno, aquí... Que, tengas un, que tengan un buen día, profesor Evelyn, eh, para nosotros en Latinoamérica, que todos tengan una muy buena noche. <risa> Les recuerdo este, que eh, la conferencia va I'm a estar... I'm tomorrow. <risa> sí, sí. <risa> I'm the next day. <risa> Exacto. Que tengamos un buen, un buen miércoles mañana eh, y usted que tenga un buen miércoles hoy, así, o algo así. Eh, <risa> este, eh, no, les comentaba, ya, yeah, sí, tal cual, <risa> mucho, muy confuso. Eh, les comentaba que la conferencia va, que está disponible, va a estar disponible en el canal de eh, YouTube de la IOF Latinoamérica, de la IOF. Y los esperamos en el, próximo, en el próximo seminario, que va a ser el 31 de agosto, donde vamos a hablar acerca de tratamiento. ¿A quién tratar? ¿Cuándo? ¿Y por cuánto tiempo? Muchísimas gracias nuevamente y buenas noches o buen día gracias. para todos. Gracias. Adiós. Gracias, Peter. Bye, bye. Gracias, Peter. Gracias. Adiós. Gracias.